two types here, where the surf there's no relative motion between the two surfaces. There's static friction, and um, it can exist in a range of forces, right? So right now the static friction on this bottle of water here is zero, but if I push on, I'm pushing on it right now. It's, there's this reactive static friction force that's preventing it from moving to a point. If I push it too hard, it'll break. Then the friction changes. Now but with the surfaces relatively moving, um, the friction changes. That's called kinetic friction. And you'd expect it to change because now there's the bonds are momentarily forming and breaking, whereas for static friction, they're just, they're, they're made, they're there until you break them. So the static friction has a, up to a maximum value that's quantified by this coefficient of static friction here. We did some examples in this. We'll do another one right now. And the kinetic friction is, is uh, it doesn't exist in a range, okay? The only thing you have to worry about here is it's opposite the, the relative motion, the motion of the object relative to the surface. Usually the surfaces are fixed. I think in this class we're going to take the surfaces to be fixed. So um, this is the magnitude, right? So if it's moving this way, the kinetic friction force is opposite the motion. So what we want to do now is, uh, actually this is a practical example. And it might surprise you. So here's the situation. We have this heavy box, 100 kilograms. How many pounds is that roughly? Yeah, all right, that's a lot. And this person can, is going to exert a maximum force of 500 newtons. All right, and there's a rope here, if you like. So we're given the coefficient of static friction. We're given this, uh, the mass of the box. And we're given the force, the magnitude of the force exerted by the person. First question, can, is the box going to move if the person pulls, pulls it, uh, you know, exerts a horizontal force on the box? So let's do that one first. And then we'll incline it at some angle here. So for zero degrees, this is simple. We draw the force diagram, all the forces on this mass. It has weight, mg, where m is 1,000, uh, 100 kilograms. There's a normal force exerted by the surface upward. That's going to balance gravity in this case, okay? Because there's no acceleration in this direction. And um, we're exerting a tension force here. There'll be a static friction force here, and unless it breaks, okay? Um, if this T is, is bigger than F of S, it's going to move. The max, this is the, uh, oh, okay, the way I've drawn it, excuse me, the way I've drawn it here is, I don't know if I like this, let me change this. But anyway, so to get around this, there's some, um, tension force here, we're going to set this to be the maximum static frictional force, and we're going to compare these two forces. If T is bigger than the maximum static frictional force, it will move, right? If it's less, it won't move. So to get the maximum static frictional force, we need to find the normal force, and then we multiply that by the coefficient of static friction, and we get 510 newtons. So what does that mean? It's not going to move, all right? That's simple. Now this is a little bit more complicated. Now we're going to angle the, the rope here. The person's going to exert again the 500 Newton force, but now it's going to be at an angle. So why are we doing that? What's interesting about this? What happens to the maximum static frictional force? Yeah, yeah why? Because you're actually kind of lowering the coefficient of friction. God, Andrew has this different way of looking at things. <laughs> okay, yes, that's, that's right. What you said was right. But the more, the, the simpler sort of pedestrian, we call it, way of thinking about it is, is this. That's right. Exactly right. That's the, that's the way to look at it. Yeah. Now you can look at it as the effective static, I mean, you know, 
Um, somebody else has probably done this before, but not, not many people, okay? So that's, that's good. So does everybody see that? The, here's the idea. This now, this component of the tension force plus the new normal force has to equal mg. See, before we just, we didn't have this, so the normal force had to be mg. Now, the normal force, I'm going to call it n prime here, is going to be less. So that makes it easier to move the box because the coefficient, the maximum static frictional force will be less because it's n prime times the coefficient of static friction. What about this? We want to move it in this way. What effect does moving, having the angle, having an angle there, what does it have on the tendency to move the object because we're pull, because we want it, because it's gonna, we want it to move in a horizontal direction. What happens there? I didn't say that very well. Um, <laughs> If I, instead of pulling horizontally here, if I pulled some, pulled some angle, what effect is that going to tend to have on my ability to move the box? Increase. Uh, it was shortly about maybe less in the x direction. Yes. So we have competing effects here. The fact that we've gone to an angle here, we lower the normal force. That makes it easier to move the box because maximum coefficient static, the maximum magnitude of the static frictional force is less. But the fact that we've reduced our horizontal, <coughs> the horizontal force here, makes it more difficult to move the box. So which one wins? Or do they cancel? Do they exactly cancel? Well, we got to calculate. Let's calculate. So here's the force diagram. And now, vertically, there's no acceleration. So I've got this normal, my new normal force, plus this component of the tension. That's going to be balanced by mg. All right. So let's go ahead and calculate. We know the numbers here. Let's, let's, in this case, we know the numbers. Let's calculate the new normal force. It, we know all these numbers. It's 770 newtons. And if we compare that here, um, before, I'm confused. What's going on here? Oh, it's the normal force. Right. So before the normal force was 980, right? Now it's less, right? So the maximum st static frictional force is mu times our new normal force. Now it's always given by this. And we find 400 newtons. And now, that's the maximum static frictional force. That's what we want to break. Now we need to find the component of our, of our, max, our 500 newton force. It's going to be less now. The question is, how much less compared to that? And you can see here that it's 450 newtons. So what do we conclude? You can move the box. You can move the box. This is like a little, maybe a little counterintuitive. You think if you really want to move something heavy, you should, in this direction, you should pull in that direction. It's not the case here. Uh, question, yes. Damon? So, with your initial tension, when you canceled it out and you made a component on the y axis. Okay, now wait, hold it, I've got to stop you. Right. So, here's our tension force, right? We're naturally going to resolve it into two components. So we strike it out and we replace it with an X component and a Y component. Okay, go ahead. No, okay, never mind. Wow, okay, that was interesting. So, so you, were, you were gonna ask a question and the way you phrased it. Yes. Okay, that's good. Oh, and then I, I attacked that and that worked. Okay, well that's good. So it is practical, right? Yeah. Now, the natural question here is, what angle, there's going to be an optimum angle you should pull this at. What is it? We know that, all we know now is 25 degrees is better than zero degrees. It's, it's dramatic. Zero degrees you can't move it, 25 degrees it moves. So which angle, how, do, how would you solve that problem to find the optimum angle? To just break the tension? To, to move the box as fast as possible. Ooh. Well, that's going to then involve the kinetic. Okay. Uh. <laughs> 
to exert the minimum force to get the box to move, which angle should you use? 44 degrees. <laughs> now you're supposed to say 45. Okay, 40, no, no. And I think I actually comment on that in here because I've bought it. Um, it's got to depend upon the coefficient of friction because as we imagine lowering the coefficient of friction, what's going to happen to that optimum angle? It's going to go horizontal. If you just have a very slight amount of, you know, it's essentially an infinitesimal amount of static friction, you want to pull horizontally. So the answer can't be 45 or 44. Okay. So what you do is <clears throat> you need to solve the problem. We've, we've seen this before in projectile motion. And forget the, I know it's 45, let's not get into the 45 degree thing, okay? The angle that maximizes the range when you fire something from some height and it lands typically lower, remember it's, it's less than 45 degrees? How would, you how, how would you find that? We didn't find it, but how would you do it? You need to find, you need to develop a formula for the range in terms of the angle, some arbitrary angle, and then differentiate that formula with respect to theta and set, set, set the result equal to zero. You need to use differential calculus. You need to find where the slope of the range versus theta curve is zero. That's going to be your maximum. Remember that? Well, we've got to do the same thing here. We've got to develop a formula for any angle. And what we need to look at is the relevant quantity here is this minus that. The higher, the bigger that is, the, be the better, okay? If it's negative, you're not going to move the box. But if this is greater than that, you're going to move the box, and we want to maximize that difference. So you would get a formula, differentiate with respect to theta, and set the derivative equal to zero. I smell a transformer. Anybody smell that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm waiting for the fire alarm to go. God. Oh no, that means if they come in here, they're gonna. They're gonna. I did all this work. You guys don't know this, but there's just one lamp here. We I went through this to try to get a better picture here. Oh. Well, hopefully they'll just do the minimum amount of. They won't touch these. It's Bill, right? I think the guy's name is Bill. I met him. I need to have a little talk with Bill. No, it's not Bill Nye. Okay. So, there's a drag. Something moves through a fluid. A fluid is a gas or a liquid. And there's another kind of resistance force besides friction, and that's drag. So let's talk a little bit about drag, right? Now this is fluid dynamics, and fluid dynamics is complicated. So, and we will hit something that will surprise you. And um, I won't try to explain it. So we'll, we'll get there, okay? So fluid dynamics is complicated. We're just gonna do some essential, look at some essential features here. So we're talking about fluids, that's a gas or a liquid. And there's a big difference between the resistive force here compared to the resistive force for friction. Here it's strongly velocity dependent. All right. So in order to appreciate uh, drag, we really have to look at what's called the drag coefficient. How many people have he heard of the drag coefficient? You've all probably heard of the drag coefficient, okay? Well, here's how it's defined. It's kind of, it's not a real simple formula, but you get used to it <laughs> like anything. The drag force, this is the force exerted when an object moves through a fluid, there's going to be a drag force opposite to the motion, right, relative to the fluid. That drag force, we'll call it capital D, is, proportion, is set equal to the drag coefficient, which is not necessarily constant. In general, this depends upon the velocity, okay? Now, some of you may not know that. Sometimes you might, might have looked up drag coefficients. Um, I'll... I'll and you see a constant value, we'll talk about that, okay? But in general, this depends upon the velocity. Here's this one half row you squared is used here. It, we just want to accept this, okay? I don't want to get, there's reasons why they do this, but we, this is not a fluid dynamics course. So the next factor here is this one half row u squared. Yo, rho is the density of the liquid, the density of the fluid. V is the speed of the body relative to the fluid. 
and this A is the cross-sectional area. Okay, now the drag coefficient here depends upon two things. It depends upon the shape of the body. If you've got a blunt body like this, you're going to get a bigger drag coefficient than if it's a sleek body, right? There's more aerodynamic. So the, um, if you have a shape where you know there's going to be more drag, you're going to get a bigger drag coefficient compared to something that's real you know, slim like that, sleek. Okay, it also depends on what's called the Reynolds number. Now we're not going to be, we're going to be doing very little with this, but the sooner you learn about the Reynolds number, the better, because it's a very important quantity. It's a dimensionless number here. It depends upon these quantities, the density, the velocity. This is the characteristic uh, length size, scale of the body. Uh, for example, for a sphere, this is the diameter. This is the coefficient of viscosity, and that's incidentally what's happening here. The reason we're feeling a drag is there's viscosity in the, uh, in the liquid. Um, now, if an object is moving sufficiently slowly, like a sphere, like this, it's moving through um, a fluid, if it's moving sufficiently s slowly, the flow is going to look like this. Let's go into the frame of reference. So somebody's moving this sphere at constant velocity. Okay, somebody's pulling on this a little string or something like that through this fluid. If we go into the frame of this, what the flow looks like looks like this. And you've all seen this before. Right? So the fluid's going by the body here. And you notice that it's nice and smooth here. No eddies, okay? That doesn't, off, that doesn't occur in practice that often, but it's, as a name, it's called laminar flow, smooth flow. In that case, the uh, drag coefficient, for example, for a sphere can be calculated. And it turns out to be inversely proportional to the velocity. So if you plug it in here, you'll see, these are all, con this is the only velocity dependence. Plug this in here, you'll see that the drag is proportional to the velocity, all right? So that's nice, that's simple. However, it's only true for laminar flow. And laminar flow, here's an example. Do you think the flow is laminar there? It's not. If I put some smoke here, you're going to start to see turbulence starting to form. There'll be eddies formed. It's not laminar. So you, it's, it's got to be low Reynolds, it's got to be sufficiently low Reynolds number or low vo velocity here. And typically it's, it's quite low for you know, normal applications. So what happens? Well, when you have turbulent flow, for a certain, for a, usually for a, a fairly good range of Reynolds numbers, the drag coefficient turns out to be constant. And when you look it up in a book, when you look, and some of you have probably done this, you look up some values on the internet or something like that for the uh, for the um, drag coefficient, you see a constant. They're in this. It's, it's, they're in this regime. And if it's a good source, they should tell you the range of Reynolds numbers, the rough range of Reynolds numbers for which it, this for the drag coefficient is constant. But I don't think all of them do. Okay. So when the drag coefficient is constant, and you can look that value up, now we have a drag force that's proportional to the square of the velocity. So this is the more typical, more practical case here. And as far as I know, nobody can calculate. And this can be calculated. We can actually calculate the, um, this was first done by Stokes in the 1800s. He actually calculated the constant of proportionality for laminar flow, which maybe is not surprising. Turbulent, forget it. Nobody, I don't think anybody can calculate that. So they do it empirically, do experiments. Now it's not gonna matter. In, in our development, it's, I don't think it's, well, I can't remember, we're gonna do a little bit of homework on this, but Sometimes it's not, it's really not important which, um, what's, what's happening here in our, in our case, in our simple case, right? So we'll see that as we go on. We'll see some of that very soon. So <clears throat> let's look at uh, free fall, right? So here's an object and we can imagine that I released it from rest and it's falling. It has some, at this moment it has some velocity. So there's going to be some drag. 
all right? And the acceleration is going to be less, obviously, because this is impeding the gravitational force. It's interesting to look at this quanti more quantitatively here. We, we, here's the force diagram. The net force, or, oh, I'm choosing, I'm choosing a down as positive, okay? That's okay, right? So this is going to be, a, this is a positive force. This is a negative force. And by Newton's second law, that will be the mass times the acceleration. Well, we can solve this for the acceleration, and we get this. So, the acceleration is reduced from the vacuum case, right? What's interesting here is how does it depend upon the mass? Now we need to be careful here because this drag coefficient depends upon, remember the drag coefficient depends upon, the. excuse me, this is the drag force. It depends upon the drag coefficient and um, it depends upon the velocity. Okay? So, what I want you to notice here is that if we have two bodies, okay, this is like Galileo, and we're going to take these to be spheres, and they have different masses, let's do it this way, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be much heavier than this, as you'll see in the demo. If they have the same size and shape, they don't have to be spheres, but if they have the same size and shape, okay, these are both spheres and they both have the same diameter, then we look up here, the drag coefficient, I got it. Uh, I didn't. I didn't actually fully appreciate this. <laughs> we want to let's. In this case, let's assume that this. This is which is typically the case. When you drop something like this, you're typically in this range of Reynolds numbers such that the drag force is proportional to v squared. <laughs> so. In this case, these are going to have both the same drag, same drag coefficient. They're going to have the same drag coefficient, right? And they certainly have the same cross-sectional area. So what's going to happen here is, and I'm, 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 having, I'm going to have to think about this. Hold on, let me make a note about something here. So the point of all this is, is that if we have a heavier body, the same size and shape, which one's going to have the bigger acceleration? Are they going to have the same acceleration? No, because of the drag, they're not going to have the same acceleration. And which one is going to accelerate faster? The heavy one. Everybody knew this, right? It was just Galileo was the one who pointed out, well, in the absence of air drag, they both fall at the same rate. That's what people didn't know. They didn't realize the basic physics there. So let's, let's demonstrate this. And it's surprisingly not that easy to demonstrate. So here are two spheres. They have very nearly the same diameter. Okay, this one, this is a ball bearing. It's very, you know, very heavy. This is a ping pong ball. Okay, this is about two and roughly, this is 2.4 grams. I don't know what this is, it's heavy. Okay, and I'm gonna release them at the same time from rest, okay? And I, may, I have to make sure I release them at the same time. Because the effect here is not that big. You might think, oh, this is just gonna scream away from this, it's gonna be obvious, but you, oh, you, you decide, you see what you think. So I'm gonna do it on three, okay? One, two, three. See that? It, the fact, I, I, could, I could tell the steel ball hit the, ground, hit the floor first. Right. But it wasn't by that much, right? Yeah. Now to um, to make this more obvious, we should use a styrofoam sphere. You know, it's, I don't know if it's obvious, but the, the um, that's that's going to be solid. So you might think, well, oh, it's, it's got a lot of mass there, but it's surprisingly how little mass styrofoam has. Well, I'm making a lot of notes today. Uh, styrofoam <laughs> sphere.
Okay, did everybody see that? It, this would struck the ground for floor first, right? Okay. Now, what's going to be mainly of interest to us in this class is this uh, phenomenon called terminal velocity. Yeah, Aaron. Uh, is it, how much would the surface area affect like, the, the dimples of the like, golf ball versus like, the smoothness of the... I mean, I imagine it's obviously minimal, but over time it probably... No, there's a lot behind this, okay? And I've, I've never looked it up on the internet, but you should be able to find it. Any golfers in here? Yeah. Um, let's see. The, the dimples are actually play a significant role in the, in the range. And if you, if you go in there and, um, let's see, what's illegal? If, so it's specified, those, those dimples are specified. Because, Anna, do you know this? So if you go in there and modify a golf ball, that's illegal. Because you can get a bigger range. Does anybody know about this? So like he's <laughs> 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 it's in the news again, isn't it? God, I, I, I just oh, wow. Yeah, well, that's the way you know professional sports is like that little edge, right? That I mean, you know, that makes all the difference in the world, right? So um, yeah, the dimples it turns out play a key role, and we really can't get into this, and. Um, we have a fluids course here that we teach where, where this is explained, but it takes a lot of development. And we're going to hit something else that's going to, that will surprise you. And this is very similar, the laces of the baseball. What if, and well, I'll talk about that a little bit. But I won't be able to explain it to you. It just takes too, too much development. Uh, you can, again, you can look on the internet, and I tried this last night, and I, it was, no, it wasn't satisfying. They just didn't have the full explanation. So that's how complicated it is. Fluid mechanics is complicated. Okay, so. What's terminal velocity? You've all heard of it. It's sort of, it's what it is, it's kind of in the name. It's, uh, if you drop an object, eventually, and it doesn't, there's no ground to interfere with it, eventually, you know, drop it in air or any fluid, eventually it will reach terminal velocity, a constant velocity. So here's what's happening. The simple diagram here shows you what's happening. Here we release it from rest with an initial velocity zero, right? So right after I release it, what's the drag force? A drag force depends upon the velocity in both of these, whoops, in both of these cases here. Oops, having trouble today. Okay, so if there's no velocity, what's the, and in, in any other case too, if there's no velocity, there's no drag force. And these can't, can't be infinite. Okay, that's, God, I'm, I'm having trouble today. Yes, it, they, as V goes to zero, in this case, the drag coefficient becomes infinite, okay? But this is going to dominate. So the, the drag for, force is velocity dependent. When there's no velocity, there's no drag force, which I think is kind of obvious if I've got this something sitting in this fluid here, and it's at rest, there's no drag force. If there were a drag force, which way would it point? You know, that's all directions are, we have symmetry here. So there's no drag force at zero velocity. So I've, I've, I haven't drawn this. Now it picks up, as it, after starting to pick up some velocity, there'll be some drag force here. As it moves faster and faster, the drag force grows, right? Because it's velocity dependent. Eventually the drag force will equal the weight and what happens by Newton's second law? The, the net force is zero, so it moves with constant velocity. So, that's the terminal velocity. That velocity is the terminal velocity. We'll be able to calculate that. Before we do that, I want to do a demonstration here. You may wonder, well, so how long do you have to wait for the terminal velocity to occur? Well, that depends upon the fluid and it depends upon the, the body. Okay? But in, in uh, some cases, it's very quick. And here's an example. So this is some pack, old packing material. It's it's styrofoam, it's roughly a hemisphere, not quite a hemisphere. And I don't think, I haven't, I don't think this has been made for a long time. Has anybody seen this before? I wonder if, you think they still make it? I have a stash, you know, but, <laughs> because I knew, you know, in the 90s when I discovered this or something, I knew to make sure to set some aside, okay, but it's slowly dwindling. 
And so why am I so concerned about this? Well, I'm going to show you. I don't even have to stand on the ladder, but I, I will. Uh, yeah, it'll show it over. I'm going to release this, okay? Watch this motion. It's dramatic. It reaches terminal velocity very quickly. Did everybody see that? There's something else that's going on here that makes it dramatic. Oh, did you see it drift this way? It's because of that fan right there. Okay. Yeah. What? Turbulence. Yeah, it's just, right, and it's turbulent. But even if it wasn't turbulent, it would be, right, that's what's causing it to fluctuate, because it flows turbulent. It's exactly right. So watch this again. It reaches terminal velocity very quickly, but there's something else that's very dramatic here. What is it? Remember the piece of paper in the physics book? Objects that are falling, and they present a lot of drag. They'll, there's an instability that will develop where they typically go like that. Remember we, we saw it with a piece of paper in the previous demo? So that's very common. When I release this, you can see it starts off, it looks pretty good, but then it just, there's a hydrodynamic, there's a fluid instability there that develops. That, that object has, doesn't go into that. So not only does it reach a terminal velocity very quickly because styrofoam is so light, it, um, it does, it's not sub, doesn't seem to be subject to that instability. So I said, fine, I'm going to take a ping pong ball and cut it in half and um, see what it does. I'm not, I didn't I wasn't planning on doing this. So it also, we don't see that instability develop, but you see that, it, 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 we don't see that, I don't see the terminal velocity. Did you see any terminal velocity there? Yeah, styrofoam is just really light. It's light. I think it's lighter than you think. Yeah. Um, okay, so quantitatively, here's something we can do. Let's look at, uh, we're going to focus on a, a baseball here. And we're, well, first we're going to focus on terminal velocity. So for terminal velocity, the drag force has to be equal to the weight. Net force, no acceleration, moves with constant velocity, called the terminal velocity. And we'll go ahead and set, for that case, the velocity will be V sub t, the terminal velocity. So if we do this in our um, definition of the drag coefficient here, we set this equal to mg, and we set this V equal to the terminal velocity, and we specialized to a sphere, we're going to set this equal to pi times the radius squared. That's the cross-sectional area. Now I'm, I need to go back and re we already used big R as the Reynolds number, so I'm going to call this little r. So we do this in that, the definition of that, the form, the expression there, the equation that's the definition of the drag coefficient. And we get this and we can solve for the terminal velocity. That's the terminal velocity for a sphere. Okay, so let's apply this to a baseball. So the mass of a baseball is about 150 grams. The in air, this is the density of air, 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. And the radius of the baseball is about 3.6 centimeters. And the drag coefficient, <coughs> you can look this up. For a smooth sphere, the drag coefficient, and we're in the turbulent regime here, we're in the regime where, you know, this, that may look okay, and this may look like this, but here we got this turbulent wake here. So we're in that region where the, where the drag coefficient becomes constant. That constant is 0.5. You can look this up for a smooth sphere. If we plug the numbers in, we get 35 meters per second. All right. And if you look in our text, you will see 42 meters per second. So that's quite a difference. That's a 17% difference there. So what do you think's going on? Well, it's, this is a smooth sphere. And baseball's not smooth, right? And it's mainly almost all due to the laces. But what effect do, do the laces have on the terminal velocity? Here it is. I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain this is what's happening here. It's greater. 
significantly, substantially greater, almost 20% greater. So you would think that the laces make it more rough, and you would think that would increase the drag, but it doesn't, it does the opposite. So why is that? Anybody thought about this or heard about this before? Yeah, it's, it's connected to that, okay? So this is, I'm not gonna try, sorry? Less frictional area because the dimples on the golf ball. Let's forget, let's forget the golf, let's just let's talk about a baseball here. So it's got these raised laces, right? You would think that they would reduce this, because this is for a smooth sphere. You would think the laces would give you a smaller terminal velocity, but they don't. And it has, yeah? So, with a smooth sphere, we've got the, uh, you have the fluids going across it, it's almost like an even path, but if you have the laces, Okay, wait, it's, it's, oh, it's still turbulent flow. It's still turbulent, but yes. even though by having the laces, does it create sort of like channels for the, the, air, for the air to flow through better at the bottom of the sphere to move through the uh, air? No, I don't think that's it. Does it minimize the eddies at the back? That's actually the answer, and how it does that is, is not obvious, but what it does is the rough sphere, which is counterintuitive, the, the rough sphere, reduces this turbulent wake here. This comes down like that, okay? Can you see that like that? And that's what gives it, um, because it, that's reduced, it's got a greater terminal velocity. Now the question is, why does making it rough here reduce that? That's what I'm not gonna try to explain, okay? And I, 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 you know, like I said, I glanced at the internet and nobody seemed to get at the real heart of the issue here. But one of the things you learn here is, you know, fluid mechanics, I keep telling you, it's complicated. This is a, it's a surprising result here. Um, we talked about releasing a, an object from rest. What if we gave it some initial velocity? So here we are, we're in a gravitational field here. And if I release um, an object from rest, what it's going to do is, initially, it's going to have a slope of minus g. We're taking up to be positive, okay? Initially, when there's very little drag force, we're gonna have an acceleration of g, a magnitude of g, right? But then, that drag force will come into play. It'll slow up the speed and it'll look like this and eventually it'll reach, term it'll asymptote to this terminal velocity value here. Okay, now, in the lab last week, right? In the lab, there's a question I think you're supposed to answer is you want to look at your data. Now your data is going to go like this, but it doesn't matter. And it should have, the slope should be close to G. You want to look for curvature in your data. And you want to look for curvature this way. Why? Why do you want to look for that? That's the point of that question. Because that would be evidence of air resistance. Air resistance is going to cause, in a vacuum it just goes like this, but air resistance is going to cause it to curve like that. To have less acceleration. That's what's exactly, this is just the flip version of that. So, and I can't remember last year. See if you see that in your data. And you have to look very carefully because, you know, this the experiment took place pretty quickly and it's a nice sleek body, right? It presents very little cross-sectional area. That picket fence or whatever they call it. So, but look for that. Now, getting back to this, what if we gave it some, um, this is an, we threw something up in the air. What's it gonna do? Well, one of the things you wanna recognize here, and the reason I sketch this graph is, no matter what velocity you give it, eventually it's gotta go to the terminal velocity. In this case, when you throw it up, now you have this acceleration, negative acceleration. Part of it's gonna be due to gravity, but then part of it's gonna be due to the drag force. So it's really, so that's why this has bigger slope here. See how this has bigger slope than here? That's because of the drag. But eventually it's gonna, that's going to conform, it's going to have to go to here. What if you throw it downward? Now what happens? I release an object downward at a speed greater than the terminal velocity. What's the, what's the, right after I release it, what does the force diagram look like? Does it look like this? No, remember, the, the greater the velocity, the greater, it's going to, this is going to, it's going to look like that. So, it's going to actually have a deceleration. Acceleration points upward because the drag force is beating out the, uh, and so that's why this is positive here. But, and again, it, what it's gonna do is it's gonna asymptote to the terminal velocity. So we'll do a few, um, 
few problems in the homework, whatever that is, on this. Wow, I'm taking too much time here. Anybody have any questions? Okay, the third and final force we're going to consider in this Newton's second, uh, this dynamics chapter here, Newton's Laws 2, you know, the second chapter on Newton's Laws, is the to deal with the uniform circular motion force. There's got to be a force here. If I've got an object moving <coughs> in uniform circular motion, that's constant speed in a circle, there's acceleration, and we've, we've calculated what the acceleration is. It has magnitude v squared over r, where v is the speed, and it always points towards the center. There has to be a force. No matter how complicated the system is, no matter how many forces there are in this mass, the net force has to be given by this. And we call it, it's so important, we, have, we give it a name, it's called the centripetal force. So here's um, a simple demo. of this, and we're going to do this experiment next week. I'm going to adjust the speed here such that the mass is right over that indicator. It, well, it, you're, you're going to do it carefully. I'm just going to do it crudely right now. But if I rotate this at the right speed, it'll be right over there, right? So this is uniform circuit. What's supplying the centripetal force here? The spring, right? The spring is stretched. There's the tension force here that's up, that's perpendicular. It's balanced by gravity. So it's a simple situation. In fact, we can determine that force experimentally by knowing, by measuring the velocity and knowing the distance and knowing the mass. We can calculate what that force is. And then you can measure it just statically. You can hook a, a string on here and see what kind of hanging weight you have to add to bring it out to there. Now you can, that's a static determination of force. And they should be the same. They should be the same. Now here's something interesting. Well, I think it's interesting. Is this uniform circular motion? Well, it's, it's once it settles down. Is this uniform circular motion? Yeah. What's supplying the force? There has to be, there's got to be a force, Newton's second law. Where is it coming from? Well, the string's vertical, right? We need to find a force horizontal. What? No, where's the force coming from? Yeah, there's, there's got to be a centripetal force. What is supplying it? The weight at the other end. The weight at the other end? No, the, we want to look at all the forces on this mass. There has to be a net force going like that, right? It's got to be. Here, let me, let me rotate it faster. Now, where's the centripetal force coming from? Now you can see it. It's the string. Whoever said the string was right. But it's this component of the tension that's doing it. So when I rotated it very slowly, it was, there was a small angle here that you really couldn't see. It's got to be. This has to be. It's Newton's second law. So in this case, this thing's going uniform circular motion. This tension force here, due to the tension of the cord, there's an upward component that balances gravity. And then there's this inward component. That supplies the centripetal force. Um, just some practical stuff here. You're in a car rounding a corner. There's got to be a centripetal force. What supplies it? The seat can. The seat belt can. Uh, the door can. If you're on the, you know, if you're in the driver's side and you're going like this, the door can. A side airbag, if it deploys or whatever word they use, that could do it, right? Uh, and a little bit of a warning here. You've all probably heard of a centrifugal force, not centripetal, centrifugal force. That's a force that is in the rotating, a rotating frame. So we're not going to look into that. That's a, if you're interested in that, that's done typically at the, high, the next level, the 2000 level of mechanics. But this is a force that arises due to the fact that you're in a uh, 
rotating frame. There's a, a cousin to it called the Coriolis force. Have you guys heard of the Coriolis? Yeah, these are, that's also a force that arises because you're not in an inertial frame. We're going to stay away from that. Um, a nice application of uniform circular motion is a rotating space station. Right? So what's one of the reasons you would want to rotate a space station? To simulate gravity. So out in, here we are out in space. Here's a person and this is the space station that's rotating here. In that frame of reference, if, imagine a person standing on a scale. And let's suppose that the acceleration here, the centripetal acceleration, is 9.8 meters per second squared. What's this scale going to read compared to the person on Earth? The same. Yeah, so this is a way of simulating gravity. The person will feel, um, will feel the same, right? Now it's not completely equivalent to a uniform gravitational field. For one thing, the acceleration here is going to be less than the acceleration there. So to have this, to feel the normal g here, you're going to feel a little less at, at your head here because you're getting closer to the center here, which has no acceleration. But typically, this is going to be a, this is large, I think, compared to a person. Uh, now, let's consider. This is a. Uh, it's like a big billiard ball. It's really hard. It seems you know, very rigid. And I put a dot on here. I want you to consider a little bit of mass of the ball right underneath the dot there. All right? And what's happening? You see the dot? What's that little bit of mass right underneath the dot doing? Yeah, uniform circular motion approximately. So there's got to be a centripetal force. What supplies it? And don't say gravity. This, we can do this out in space, right? Gravity's irrelevant here. The mass of the ball? The other particles around it? Ah, uh, you're on the right track. It, it has to be. Somehow, that's right. It's, so specifically, what's, what has to happen here? This is surprising. The ball has to deform. Right now, there's no, there are other particles near it. And there are, they could be exerting forces. All right, the net force has to be zero because there's no acceleration. When this is rotating like this, this ball actually stre expands a little bit because there has to be, something has to give rise to that um, centripetal force. This thing's going around, it's going around like this, there has to be a, a force like that. And so what it, it comes about because this is going to uh, bulge a little bit. That's called equatorial bulge sometimes because it applies to planets. Planets is the same way. So there's no such thing as a rigid body. We just proved that. Because you can take anything, anybody says there's a rigid body, you can take it, spin it like this, to account for the cent centripetal force that has to be on, on a little bit of mass there. The only way the object can supply that is by um, elongating in that direction, by distorting. Here's another example. Okay, so here's this, this wire hoops here, right? And you can see, now it's not spherical right now. Okay, so it's not spherical, but when I go like this, what has to be happening here? I've got mass that's going in a circle. The only way, here it doesn't feel a force. Here there's no force. Here there's got to be a force. So what has to be happening? This thing has to be going like that a little bit. And you can't see it, right? But watch this. There. God. Very obvious. That's why I put these on. It's very obvious now. Whoa. So planets do this. All, naturally, when they're formed, they're, they have this angular momentum. They're rotating like that. When they're liquid, gaseous, or liquid state. And eventually, you know, they cool down and they, um, they freeze in this equatorial bulge. The Earth has an equatorial bulge. It's not huge, but it's there. Okay, well, let's do a problem. Let's do a problem. 
here's a, a car rounding a corner. Okay, this is the top view. If I look from here, or, or from the other side, here's the force diagram that I see. There's gravity down, there's this normal force up, and then there's got to be what supplies the centripetal force here. This is a level road. It's got to be friction that satisfies, that, that supplies the centripetal force. And in this case, because the, we're assuming the car is not skidding, the tire is going on the road like this, there's no relative motion, so we use the coefficient of static friction. So in this case, we're given, um, it's constant speed motion, we're given the radius, we're given the coefficient of static friction. What is the maximum speed without slipping? Well, static friction is supplying the centripetal force here, and that has a maximum value, so we're going to max that out. And that's going to give us, when we solve for this, the, 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 the maximum speed. So what do we know here? We know that these two forces have to balance. We've seen this many times. Newton's second law for uniform circular motion tells us that the force, which is the maximum static frictional force here, is the mass times the acceleration, which is V squared over R. We can substitute this expression into here, <coughs> simplify, and solve for V. One equation, one unknown. And we find that it's 15.3 meters per second, which is about 34 miles per hour in this case. All right? So do you have to have friction to round a corner? Yeah. You might think so. Yeah, but that's, you know, it would have to be more like a chain, wouldn't it? This is a car, right? Yeah. No, there's another way. You bank the turn. We'll do that tomorrow. We'll start off with that tomorrow.